This program is brought to you by Emory University. Good afternoon, and uh, my name is Paul Wells, as Jim said. And I guess I'm to blame for, the, or credit for blame for the title of this session, and it was something that I threw out in conversation with Jim, one of our telephone conversations over the last couple of months. And it's something that I, I try to remember where I first heard this stereotype that you know, Scotsmen play with the bow and Irishmen play with the, fiddle, with the fingers, um, which is, of course, a you know, vast oversimplification of, 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 in, of both traditions. But there's a certain amount of truth to it, as there usually is with stereotypes. And if you were here with, listening to Jamie last night, you saw the power that he puts into his bow. And um, that certainly is a characteristic of much Scottish fiddling, particularly um, modern Cape Breton fiddling, a uh, tradition that, that I'm quite fond of. Um, and Irishmen will play, um, will accentuate the, uh, the finger ornamentation. But there's a lot of very wonderful Irish music out there uh, particularly um, that played by some older players, where, and, and certain styles, where there really isn't all that much ornamentation. So, you know, take your stereotypes for what you will. I don't know about Appalachian fingers. They don't use either the fingers or the bow, right? <laughs> but if there's some... Only occasionally. Only occasionally. Um, you know, if, 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 if you heard my talk this morning about, you know, the, the growth of regional repertoires of, of, of fiddle tunes, um, certainly what grew up in different areas was different ways of approaching the fiddle of playing the instrument, and that's what we want to get at here today. Um, I don't know, maybe some of you are more familiar with one of these styles than the other, or maybe they're all new to, to some of you. Um, but people who have listened to a lot of fiddle music can usually tell in the first few notes, oh, that's a, an Appalachian old time guy, that's an Irish fiddle player, that's, that's a Cape Breton or Scottish fiddle player. And I hope we could get, some, get these guys to show you some of the things that they do that give their music, give their fiddling that distinctive sound. It's something that, that's relatively easy to hear, but often very difficult to articulate and understand just what it is that's going on differently. So why don't we just go, go down the line here and let everybody play a tune by way of introduction, and then we might get into some more points of detail and nitty gritty. So, Alan Jabor. So, well, here's how I play Hoplite Ladies, which we talked about earlier, you talked about actually, as a tune that's played in Scotland, where it, apparently originated, and Ireland, which apparently picked it up quickly thereafter, and uh, in America especially, well, actually all regions of America, yeah, yeah. but in the South they call it Hoplite Ladies or other names like Uncle Joe or whatever. Uh, I'll say parenthetically that names of lords and ladies didn't survive the transatlantic <laughs> passage very well in the South, especially, where lords and ladies didn't seem an, an urgent thing to evoke. Before moving on to Jamie, we could just ask Alan or get him to show us a little bit of some, some of the tricks he was using there. I noticed a very strong down bow that he was using to start some of the phrases. So and really you always start, out. even the pickups in, in Appalachian tradition, you always start with the down bow. So you start yeah, that way. Really. You never go. Yeah. Well, you could, but that's sort of unidiomatic, you might say. Yeah. And then. 
I do that, maybe I pick that up from the Irish guys. I don't know. It's fun to do little grace notes once yeah. in a while. You ready? Yeah. Now here's pure Henry Reed. So the bowing pattern is three separates, down, up, down, and then a slur, three notes in one bow stroke, up bow, uh, and then two more separate. So you're breaking up eight into three, three, and two, which is the classic American syncopation pattern. You can get this from me. It first appeared in fiddling. Uh, so uh, anyway, uh, that pattern is very common in Appalachian fiddling. And many people think it's an African-American thing from jazz to do that syncopated pattern. And it kind of is, but, uh, but it appeared a century earlier than jazz and ragtime and blues and all those things. So you, you can't say that if it was an African-American contribution, it came because African-American fiddlers were part of the blend along with Irish and Scottish and Lord knows what-ish uh, yeah. fiddlers who created in the late 18th, early 19th century, the Appalachian style, the, what we think of as the old Appalachian style. And that style isn't descended from styles in the British Isles. It, in the same period, they were figuring out the modern what we call the old time Irish style and the modern, what we call old time <laughs> Scottish style. These were all cousins in a great revolution that occurred in the 18th and into the early 19th century in dance music and in the fiddle. The fiddle became the, the instrument of this new revolution because it was suddenly being cranked out by the hundreds or thousands, you know, in European manufactories. And, it democratized it and sort of changed the nature of the music. Uh, but in each region, it changed according to regional predilection. And, and so the uh, Appalachian predilection is more syncopation. Uh, I didn't do other things. This is borrowed from the old world, so it wasn't a tune that started on the high part. But actually, you could even... You could start on the high part and then do the low part. That would be hyper Appalachian, but typical Appalachian, especially in Appalachian created tunes, is to start on the high part and go down to the low part. All right, I'll hush. Um, one other thing I might add before moving on is that Alan mentioned you know possible influence from African American fiddlers, and it's probably a good thing to say to point out that historically there were tons of black fiddlers in the states, in the colonies and in the states. Um, they were presumably taught their music by, by their white masters. Um, but if you read diaries and travelers' accounts and local histories and such, just you know, reference after reference after reference to, to, to black fiddlers in, in areas from New England to, to the south. So this was, this was not unusual at all at the time. And one more thing I'd like to have you demonstrate a little bit. You were doing a lot of sliding into notes, particularly hitting, hitting oh, unisons yeah. or clusters. So classic Appalachian technique to create a unison, which is the same note on two, on two strings to emphasize it. And of course, it's never perfectly in tune, which emphasizes it even more. Better if it's uh, not. So all the better. Uh, but typically, you go into it with a little grace note. So not just, but. Oh, one more Henry Reedism. Okay, good. And Henry Reed being um, a source of much My of Alan's music, his, his, his Alan's hero. <laughs> All right, moving. Jamie, do you would you like to play the same tune or do something different or whatever suits your pleasure? I actually know that tune, so. Uh, All maybe, right. Uh, um, I'll play some pipe tunes. That's the that. that's such a prominent part of the Scottish fiddle tradition. Uh, there's a couple of uh, Highland tunes.
So right off the bat, Jamie defies the stereotype about Scotsman's using a lot of, punct a lot of you know, short bow strokes to punctuate because he was using extremely long bow strokes on those tunes. That was lovely. But I'm sure he'll later he'll play some stress bays or something where they really, really goes after it with single notes. So what else would you like to tell us about the tunes, your style? Or? Oh, well, um, I think uh, I just kind of wanted to reinforce that, um, that there are these contrasts. That, so it doesn't have to be all a real... Uh, rugged bow, although it's certainly um, the, the Scottish character is this uh, rugged, ferocious, you know, uh, spirit. And um, so uh, it, it, the music is, is um, real, I think of it as just kind of based on the Highland bagpipe. You know, it was, it was only later in the sort of, um, I suppose, after Battle of Culloden, really, when uh, the sort of English Baroque started to pervade Scotland, and it was it was in vogue to to play violins instead of Highland pipes, you know. So uh, all of a sudden, then sort of this a slightly classical sound came in, and and um, then you know you can you can actually play a lot more notes on the violin than you can in uh, with a Highland pipe, which is uh, they can only do nine notes. They Those are the only notes that a Highland pipe can play. And um, so because of that, also because of the, the character of the pipes, it uh, is very crisp going from one note to another. So then the, uh, the ornamentation uh, and the, the shape of the melodies that, become, that, that are devised are often quite angular because they sound very crisp and puppy and puck, puck. And um, so later on when the pipes weren't uh, emulated as much because the, the, for a while there the violin or the fiddle was king and uh, so then the, the melodies changed up a, a bit but um, if, you're, if you're actually imitating the pipe music you know the pipes don't have a bow right so then uh, they have one stream of air and uh, so then that would be the one long bow you know and uh, and the problem, of course, is when you get to a, a place in the tune where there is more than one note in a row of the same pitch, as, it, as for example, three, you know, three notes, we, we just change the bow, but pipes don't have a bow. So that's where you would do... Uh, so then it's, that's where the, the fingers, you know, and the pipers, they say, oh, a really good piper has good hands. Oh, he, she has good hands. He has good hands. That, that's what they're talking about is the, uh, the, all the articulation of the same pitched notes uh, being um, shown by various kinds of ornaments. And, and that's the piper's art there. It's just like, do you do, you do one ornament? Or you do... Or... You know, all kinds of different possibilities there. Um, and uh, so, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the Boeing style, too, as we, we go on. But uh, that was kind of just meant to show the, the importance of the piping tradition. Thank you, Jamie. Okay, Henry, can you favor us with a tune of your own choosing? Okay. Uh, well, I live in, uh, I live on the west coast of Clare in Ireland and uh, it's a place that's got lots of music. And there's a certain, what the area where I live, certainly most of the ornamentation is done with the fingers. And also the, I, I think certainly the dominant uh, influence on the ornamentation has been pipes as well, but not Highland pipes, Indian pipes, but uh, mm -hmm. the, the rolls and everything. They sound very similar anyway. So anyway, this is a, a G.
I can get you to talk a little bit uh, about and demonstrate some of the finger ornamentation you were doing, some of the little tricks? Okay, well, most of the, primarily it's the rolls that I would be using. So, if you can, say if you used to do a roll on the first thing, you, you split, you, you actually, the next note will be a third up, so you get a real throaty. Then if, if it's higher than that, say you're using the second finger, you wouldn't get that, that throatiness. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, they, you do what you can. I, I wouldn't, what was I going to say? I mean, there are people that, that have a huge array of roles. One that I'll mention in particular, and I don't know, was he ever here? Was James Kelly ever here? Oh, yeah. Yeah, well, if you want to hear somebody who's got upside down, inside out, every way a role can be played, he's a guy who lives in Miami, who used some Dublin originally. Fantastic fiddle player. But he's got that, all sorts of variations. But it's, again, most of it does come from the pipes. We talk a little bit about what a role what, what is. So it's, 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 if you slow it down, it's like, that's it. It's taking a note, so, a fundamental note, and doing an upper grace and then a lower grace. Is that that's right. But, but you compress it, and really, usually you hang on to the, the bass note and stick the roll in at the very last, so it's... So instead of actually hearing all those notes, really what you hear is almost a percussive effect. Yeah. It's, a, it's supposed to be a very rhythmic sort of thing. It's it's not really like a, a Baroque violinist would do more five even notes, I would think, would da 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 da. And yeah, this is just real them out and everything would be even. Well, 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 but the Baroque violinists do that because they've learned that from the music. Yeah. And the music makes even notes out of it, but yeah. we don't actually know how they played it in the Baroque. That's true. They might have played it like Henry. That's true. Mm. That's true. Fine. That's true. Sorry, I had to end it. Jump no, in that's there. fine. That's a... And uh, I just had an idea, and it flew out of my head. Something about Baroque violins. I don't know. One of one of the oh, I know what it was. That um, you know, if you listen carefully to each of these guys, um, their music has some swing to it. The note values don't are not necessarily all even. They tend to. I, I would think. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong. They're definitely not. No. Yeah. I mean, the, 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 there's more emphasis and a little more time on the first note of a group of, of three or four or something. So you go da 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 not da 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 da. It's not Vivaldi, you know. It's not a machine. It's, it's not a machine. <laughs> and if you hear a classical violinist say, "Oh, well, I, I can pick up this book of fiddle tunes and, and play these tunes," and they're not that hard, they'll come out very even, and it won't sound like fiddling. It will sound like a violinist playing Vivaldi or something. Um, so I mean, you can listen to each each of the different styles treats this kind of rhythmic swing or, 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 or imbalance or whatever a little bit differently, I think. Um, but it's, it's one of the things that really distinguishes fiddling as a world from, from classical violin playing. It's that dance ability that gives it real punch and real drive. I was thinking when Jamie was playing, I had a lot of his roles. I mean, they're almost note for note crowns. You know, they're, they're very accurate. Whereas the stuff that I'm playing, almost all fiddle players in Ireland, anyway, would have the sort of ornamentation that I was using. It's universal almost, you know, everybody plays. I mean, you wouldn't hear many players that would have, that would be so precise. I mean, that really was was a dead on, you know, maybe Sean Keane would do it, you know, but not me, you know. So it's, it's become, it's just been incorporated into the music, and people don't really think of it in terms of, well, here's some fun. People talk about pipe tubes, but that's a great pipe tube or something like that. But uh, if you don't think that way, you're actually playing. Mm -hmm. Jamie made a good point when he and I were discussing this earlier that uh, as he, he has said a short time ago, um, a lot of the uh, um, Scottish fiddling fiddle tunes in the repertoire is shaped on the Highland pipes, which has a what? A, bas they're basically they're an A, most, key of A, major most of them. Right. Um, you know, I suppose, like um, after the after pipe makers have crafted the instrument over centuries, you know, the right length, the right spacing of holes, the right diameter, all that, they um, they have come up with the kind of the classic Highland pipe, which is very brilliant. In fact, the uh, the ones that you hear out in the let's say the pipe band competitions or in the parades, those are 
a cranked up version of a Highland pipe, which it plays not an A, in fact, but it's uh, the pitch has been raised and raised and raised. So now it's a very, very sharp B flat, like it's 13 cents high of a B flat. And that's kind of been finally settled on as acoustically the most ideal proportion of, of the diameter and the length and, and that to get the, the most power and the most brilliance. And uh, EJ, who is a pipe maker, has made a Highland set that is in A so that I can play with him, you know, and other people can play. Um, but even in A, it's still close to acoustically ideal and therefore it's very brilliant. And um, so that brilliance is, it has kind of affected the type of melodies that are devised. Mm -hmm. um, they tend to be very sort of like arpeggiaic rather than flowy, you know, the sort of the, the linear, um, melismatic kind of melodies that you get in the Irish music. Yeah. And the, uh, the Irish pipes, the Illan pipes, have a much wider range, wider compass than, than Highland pipes do. They can go two octaves or better. And the bottom note on an Illan pipe is a D, which corresponds with the second lowest string on the fiddle. Um, although the fiddle can go down to areas where the pipes can't. But that range of D on up to what is basically first position of the violin you can play Irish music all day long and stay within that range, whether you're playing fiddle or pipes or flute, or any of the wind instruments, flute or, or penny whistle, kind of fall within that range as well. So there's, this, you know, there's, there's a certain amount of, the music is shaped and driven certain, to a certain amount by the technology of the instruments, I mm -hmm. think, and, and the design of the instruments. Um, let's talk about tune types a little bit. Um, Alan played what we would call a breakdown or a reel. Uh, that in Scots and Irish would call that Miss, Miss or Mrs. McLeod's reel, and Alan called it which do, what name? Uplight ladies. Uplight ladies. And then Jamie played some marches, and Henry played a jig. Would you play many jigs? Would you play many marches? Uh, people in, often, in the Appalachian tradition, not you personally. <laughs> yeah, people ask uh, often, well, what happened to jigs in Appalachian tradition? And uh, there's a kind of a, basically they didn't win out. What can I say? You know, my answer my, might be there, but they, they there. didn't all die either. Yeah. Some of them survived, but in transformed mm -hmm. form, so that. Oh, this is, by the way, not a jig. It's a march, but jig time and march time, quick step time in marching, is the same as jig time and dancing. And anyway, what's the difference between marching and dancing? Mm. There isn't any difference. Mm. Any, but, but that's another subject for another Women. day. Women. <laughs> Women. <laughs> well, you could march. We're integrating our armed forces. You can have. Yep. Yeah. Historically. Historically. <laughs> well, let's see. I, so. That's a 6-8 time, a jig time tune from Scotland called, uh, originally called uh, New Rig Ship, uh, which then found its way into America, was converted into March repertory, which as I explained earlier is not a hard conversion. You just, you just keep playing and they do marching instead of dancing, which in fact is dancing. Anyway. Uh, 
but uh, that conversion happened on many tunes, mm -hmm. and I play actually several that, that I know in both 6-8 and, mm -hmm. and, uh, and in 4-4 four, four time or breakdown time. So some of the tunes got absorbed into the general breakdown repertory, and some just died. You know, because 6-8 time wasn't common anymore. In the South, after the Civil War, the 6-8, which was used mostly for those quick steps, well, the local militia got suppressed after the Civil War, you know, and so the, the only reason I learned the one I just played you, which I learned as Chapel Hill Serenade, mm. is in the name. Mm -hmm. These guys were good at marketing, they thought, we can't do marches anymore, we'll change the name. <laughs> and so they, they, they called it Chapel Hill Serenade. This is not insurrection anymore. What could be more innocuous? And, and so, a serenade, so, so yeah. I'm there, I'm through. No, that's fine. And would, would Henry Reed have played many 6-8 tunes? He didn't play yeah. me. He played a yeah. couple, yeah. just the, the conventional set piece 6-8 tunes like Irish Washer yeah. Woman. Haste to the Wedding, something like Haste that. Haste to the Wedding, I think he did play that. Yeah. And just going to offer this about uh, Jake's not surviving in Appalachian music. Although I'm not a banjo player, never learned claw hammer, but I've spent quite a bit of time you know, around claw hammer banjo players and watching their technique. And with this, you know, buck, 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 uh, there's a real physicality to the way that sounds. And um, it's my belief that uh, the jig rhythm doesn't translate well in that type of motion. And um, so I think it's a banjo-driven historical uh, issue. I, I, I usually don't say this out loud because I play, I've got to live with my banjo players here, you know. But, uh, but I do think there's something to what you're saying. And, yeah. and I'll have to say that in central North Carolina, I recorded one guy playing maybe that tune or some other 6-8 tune with his banjo playing brother-in-law uh, and the two of them played all the time together and I swear the fiddle player was going <laughs> doing 6-8 time their kind of 6 time. and the banjo playing player was going yut tuk 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 and I thought I can see who's going to win this match in the long run you know so. a little bit of old time surrealism there or something yeah. And, and on the question of jigs, you know, I, I might question whether people say, what happened to the jigs? I might question whether they're even here very much in the first place, um, except in, in military use, you know, fifing and, and, and drumming and marching and whatnot. Um, yeah, and the word, the word jig the word was jig. also used uh, for in the minstrel stage and elsewhere yeah. for a two-force. A very highly syncopated. Right, uh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, jig is one of those words that's got just lots of different musical meanings. Well, it's Geige in German. Jig. Jig in French. It means something different in all those languages. Yeah. Anyway. Jamie, your turn. <laughs> Amaze us with something else. Uh, well, it uh, might be appropriate to give you a little uh, stress which is really the, uh, you can really see why there would be a stereotype of the, the Scottish fiddlers using the bow a lot, because um, although pipers do play stress bays, obviously, but th they have a kind of a different take than, than how fiddlers generally like to play them, which is uh, more choppy. And uh, so pipers get the choppy effect by tons of decorative notes played very, very fast and smashing together, making a, an explosive sound. And, um, uh, you know, m so many of the Highland-based tunes are either in A or some nearby re relative of A, but, uh, so then, you know, D, B minor, etc. but A is not the, the best note on the fiddle to play a really crunchy, explosive uh, finger-based ornament, because it's an open string. You can make a, a, an approximation, but on the pipes, they're A, ornament down there is just ferocious. It's just great. It's just, uh, and so like uh, fiddlers have sought to s come up with something and it's generally, they've, they've used the bow instead. So you have like, <laughs> and just really lay into it big time. Uh, and in still, it's not as good as the pipe version. But um, so that's, that's what pipers do with stress bass. So I, I'm just actually gonna 
um, play a stress bay showing a lot of bow strokes, which would be the typical way uh, most Scottish fiddlers might approach it. Oh, by the way, um, the uh, foot tapping pattern is really important to notice because uh, you can always tell a person who hasn't been raised with a, a good long tradition of playing stress bays or Highland music because they'll typically tap their foot da, da, da on every second beat, just as you would in a reel or a march or any popular music. You know, it'd always be boom, cat, boom, cat, boom, cat. Backbeat would be the cat part. And then, so, um, but, uh, so then, you know, when I, when I play with guitar players, let's say, and it's like, oh, let's play a strispe. And so when they're doing like, da, 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 ah, it doesn't know Scottish music. Because it's always on, on the beat, because that's how dancers dance a stress bay. It's very, very pronounced. It's like a stamping machine. Ta, 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 ta. So then you, you watch their feet next time when you see somebody play a stress bay. Notice that it, 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 a lot of times their jamming was getting a lot of power with his up bows. You know, it's sort of as a precedent to a really strong down bow, but you're really punching the, the up bow a lot too. And what, what do we know about you know historically the, the style? You know, well, was this something the way Neil Gow might have played in, in the late? Yeah, the definitely. Century, well, I have a, a belief that a lot of the, the Scottish vigor behind the bow arm was because. Uh, Fiddlers were playing for huge groups of people at dances, and there's no PA, in, obviously, in the 1800s. So there's uh, Neil Gow was among the early, really superstar fame fiddlers, and then there was a long line of people after him, Scott Skinner and um, lots of folks up there in the kind of the uh, Perthshire area, area. That's kind of northeast Scotland around uh, Dunkeld was a really uh, hotbed up there. and. Um, but a lot of these people, like Scott Skinner, who was actually a classical violinist in his earlier life, and you can kind of hear that in his, in his compositions, but um, he would play for these fabulous balls with all these fancy royalty, blah de blah and uh, sometimes play like three dances in a day. He'd like travel great distances and play another dance for two or three hours and then on, on the horse and play for 900 people a day sometimes, or more, you know. And, um, uh, and so then you've got all these people and you just need to crank out the sound uh, just as wildly as possible. And so, um, yes, a, a big down bow because you've got gravity to you know, help you with a real uh, strong uh, sound. And then uh, on the up bow, it, it got to be known as the driven up bow. So you do a, a, a crazy hard down bow and then and then you'd curl in two or three notes into the up bow. So you'd have like, um, uh, how about maybe I'll switch tunes. Uh, uh, you'd, you'd push the up bow. Uh, what's a perfect example? Um, uh, 
uh, where you kind of give an extra, extra nudge on the up bow to kind of kick, kick the, the beat as, as much as possible. And you're also doing a lot of very fast single bows on that uh, you played a while ago, playing a group of what would be four 16th notes or 32nd notes, depending on how you Yeah, well, there's and the... And using a bow for every one of them. Right. The bow stroke. For the, uh, for the just the, the classic uh, Scott snap, I suppose, you'd have like... you just have that down up, you know. And then if there's a pickup to the Scott snap, you'd have... Um, uh, how about uh, so there'd be a pickup to the because the, the the snap would be down up and then there's a pickup note right before the snap right so then there, that would be a three note I guess yeah so and then uh, if you'd have a single note that you'd want to make some kind of a a vigorous ornament, then you could add one extra bow stroke. So instead of up, down, up, it would be down, up, down, and then whatever else happens at. So that would be like, um, um, uh, um, well, I could maybe, uh, yeah, where you have a, you know, you know, several, several strokes in a row. Yeah. yeah, good. Henry, could good. you talk about some of... I'm sorry, did you have no, a comment no, no. on it? Do you ever, ever do a snap, a scotch snap, up, down? Because I never do. Right, I never do. Uh, I haven't I actually... It's interesting, it's not random. You just never do it that way. Yeah. It's always down, up. Yeah, because, um, you know, you're using gravity to help you with, yeah. the, you know, <laughs> pulling the arm down. I haven't actually... Um, it might be interesting to make a survey if there are any Scottish fiddlers who do them on the up. You know, because uh, there are up-driven fiddlers. I see it all the time in Irish music. There will be uh, people have a really great groove. Like Kevin Burke is a is a. I, I haven't noticed yet whether you're an up bow driven or a down bow driven. You're a down bow driven. Yeah, yeah. But um, Kevin Burke is is quite up bow driven, um, and there are you know a few around. It's really interesting. It's still very rhythmic, but it just happens that that's kind of what they prefer. But I don't know about Scottish fiddlers. I, I don't think I've ever seen anybody do it on Maybe up. they just, maybe such fiddlers never do a Scotch snap, so maybe there's no Scottish fiddlers then. Well, if you, like a friend, I know, you'd hear a lot of playing that's quite similar. There's a huge Scottish influence around that area, and they, that's very much bow driven, and they play stress bass, and nowhere, nowhere else in the country does it. But up, up around there, you know, there's a really distinctive style. And they don't, well, you know, it's changed a bit now because there's a, the regional styles aren't as prominent as they used to be. But, but the real traditional style didn't really use rolls that much at all. You know, almost all of all everything was done with the bow. And they used double stops a lot, mm -hmm. we, and, but, uh, which is something that you don't hear. But they can the thing they carry, and a lot of them have but that they rely on a kind of swing, a real kind of a lyrical feel to their music. You know, there's a will to it all the time, and that's why that's why it's not so prominent. They're not looking for that real hard drive or the sound. You know? But they get a real, a, a, a really nice, beautiful rhythmic sound. They just don't have to keep it so hard. Mm -hmm. yeah. so, Could you uh, demonstrate and talk about some of your own bowing techniques, Henry? I mean, the Irish triplet bowling, which is kind of similar uh, to what Jamie's doing, yeah, but, but see, I, I would be pretty typical in that I don't really use that much okay. bowing. You know, I mean, I'll use, he touched on it, and that, I mean, I'll use triplets when I, hit, when I get to an open string, but I prefer, I, I prefer doing it with my fingers if I can, you know? It's just lazy. <laughs> <laughs> it's personal. Place, place okay. Okay. Uh, 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 set of reels or
Well, that, that tune that Henry played features a lot of what violinists and fiddle players would call string crossing, going back and forth from one string to another. Yeah. I noticed you were doing a lot of that with, with single bows. Would you ever do it more with putting more, um, more notes into a single stroke? To, to because so some players but, do. But people have different ways of doing it. Right. You know, I do it because I, I like to. I like to. And it's, that features in Irish music an awful lot. That sort of. But there are people that. Kevin, for instance, would be a real good example of somebody who, who, who breaks it up, slurs into the note. Yeah. And. Tommy Peasel's another person that does, you know, has a really unique bowing style and uses. But most players use a combination just like all fiddlers. You know, you don't actually, it's not calculated. Yeah. <laughs> and it depends on what the setting is. Sometimes there, there are conventions by the right rules, necessarily. Yeah, There's first, not rigidity to it. Yeah, I'm sure it's say, in Appalachia, I'm sure that like, it would depend on what the instrumentation is. But if you're playing, say, with flute players, for instance, you smooth it out a little bit more. You don't necessarily make it as because it, you know. Well, you know, you, you, everybody adapts to a certain degree. Yeah. Like where I, where I live, another, one of the main instruments is the concertina. Mm -hmm. It blends really well with the fiddle. But that's, it's, uh, that would be very, very rhythmical, you mm -hmm. know. Or, uh, that's the way I play with it, you know. You wouldn't, it, 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 you, a lot of short bows, you know, and uh, not long phrases. But it, you adapt, you know, to whatever, whatever you're playing with, whatever you're trying to make everybody does that. Uh, you know. We all love that. <laughs> Let, let's talk a little bit about the other instruments you guys might play with and how that might differ from, from area to area. Um, Alan, I know you're touring a lot with, with Ken Perlman now. Um, what would be you know, your typical or what might, you, know, you see as a typical or preferred instrumental combination? I love fiddle and banjo. Mm -hmm. I always have. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and so I, I tend to gravitate toward it. And, and uh, you know, as long as the banjo player is happy, then I'm happy. <laughs> uh, uh, but uh, uh, I like guitar too, actually. Yeah. Yeah. And banjo and fiddle and guitar are, are a nice trio. It's a fairly classic uh, old-time combination. Well, but I've done it all. What can I say? And I think Henry's right that what you're doing tends to affect how you're playing as well. I played, I did a record with Sandy Bradley on piano, and, and uh, that probably affected the way I was rendering the tunes uh, as much as uh, Tommy Thompson, who was the banjo player for it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, a lot of the fiddle players also in the old days, I think, were affected not by who they were playing with, because often they were playing alone, but by the fact that they were also the fifer. We, we tend to compartmentalize history, and we imagine the fiddler as one person, because that has a different role, and the fifer as another person, because they have a, another role, but actually, in 19th century America, the, very often the fiddler and the fifer were the same person. And therefore, there was a kind of a natural influence stylistically in both directions, I think. Mm -hmm. That is, it influenced the fifing style. Perhaps we know little about that because we have so few recordings of it in the South, at least. And, uh, but it probably affected the fiddling, too. Now, when Alan talks about playing with a banjo player, he's talking about um, a five-string banjo player. Um, I guess Ken's not here, but you probably noticed when Ken was playing last night, and he'll be playing later, there's a, you know, a fifth string halfway up the neck. Um, that is probably comes from the original progenitors of the banjo that came over from Africa, because there are some illustrations pretty early on. I don't remember the dates exactly, probably 17th century paintings of, of slave musicians playing a banjo-like instrument with that drone string there. That's, half, that's you know, part way up the neck. And you mostly, the, in old-time tradition, you don't finger that. It just drones away. Um, sometimes people try to equate that with you know, the drones from a bagpipe or something. But no, this is not a Scottish or an Irish thing. It's an African thing. Now, Henry, do you, upon occasion, play with banjo players? I do. I and do, do they five-string five banjo players no, or four-string banjo? Four-string no. They just five the five-string banjo just yeah. doesn't seem to... Doesn't register. You know, so it's, it's up there. 
around where I hit them, you wouldn't run into very, they were, well, maybe it's just worth just coincidence, but they're not too many banjos. It's around all that. <laughs> and the tenor banjo, the four string banjo, is actually a product of the jazz age. Um, you know, there are earlier banjos prior to the, you know, the formation of the five string that we know now. Might have had fewer strings, but they weren't quite this form of the tenor banjo, which is tuned usually an octave below the fiddle, at least in Irish music. And this was something um, that was developed in the early 20th century as a product of the jazz age. Um, uh, guitarists who wanted to be heard in jazz bands more. They, they, they kind of um, you know, came up with this, this kind of instrument that would, would cut through the sound of, of brass instruments more. And so that's, that's a case, pretty clear case, where something has gone from America to Ireland, um, not the other way around. Yes. The tuning is, is the same, it's an octave apart. Is that right? Yeah, yeah. So they're tuned just yeah. in fifths? In fifths, yeah. How about that? Um, and a mandolin is tuned the same as, as a fiddle in the same octave. But that's why it's relatively easy for musicians to switch for, from one to the other, although the, you know, the right-hand technique is completely different. But you know, the point I'm trying to get across here is that you know, five-string banjos that are sort of part of the heart and soul of Appalachian fiddle music um, don't fit well with Irish music particularly. What about Scottish music? In terms I, I, of instruments yeah. played. Yeah, yeah, he wants you to use the mic. Sorry. Yeah. I should give a quick footnote there and say that, that if you're Ken Perlman, your, 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 your banjo playing fits very nicely with all kinds of fiddle music. <laughs> but but Ken, Ken is a, a unique individual and a unique player. Yeah. I've, um, I've been seeing tenor banjos uh, turn up in Scotland more and more, um, kind of probably copying the, I mean, it's, it's really beautiful. I, so I don't know how everybody feels. I, I love a great tenor banjo flat pick, you know, mm -hmm. uh, in Irish music. It's, I think it's just a gorgeous blend there. And um, I suspect that other people in, in Scotland have kind of noticed that lovely blend. And uh, so I, I'm starting to see that four string tenor banjo flat pick approach showing up more and more as sessions in Scotland. Okay. Um, we have, we're approaching three o'clock here. So why don't we uh, um, open the floor to questions, comments? First of all, I beat with my heel, not my toe. I never used my toe and most Appalachian fiddlers and southern fiddlers generally beat with their heel, not their toe. And so you're actually poised on your two, the balls of your feet and your fanny. It's like a three point operation here, you know, um, fanny and two balls of feet. And then the, the heels are going up and down. And I tend to, once I get revved up, to use both of them, you know. And I don't use them in any calculated pattern, but I have a feeling. It sort of amounts to a kind of a, a chaotic, rough, bum chicka bum chicka bum sort of thing. You know? uh, uh, but is the actual impact exactly on the beat with my fiddling? I don't know. You say maybe a little early. That's great theory. I love it. I'll have to. If somebody would just videotape me, I could study this, you know. So, uh, you know, when you feel the impulse footwise and when the impulse translates into an impact or maybe different. And so maybe, I don't, but then I would have started even earlier, you know. I can't analyze it. It's a great question. Thank you. Jeff, I had two. Uh uh, disparate questions, and uh, one probably is directed towards uh, Jamie. And uh, we, uh, you constantly refer to Highland pipes and Highland music, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Is there a lowland uh, a fiddling tradition? Definitely lowland. Well, that's uh, that. That's where the there was this kind of overlap of the English Baroque and classical music, and uh, so that. And nowadays we hear that sound in Scottish country dance. That's, it's kind of the more genteel, melodious. So instead of the, the crazy, wild uh, stress bay, for example, you'd hear more of a lyrical stress bay like this.
The uh, second question is, uh, we probably did a whole other session on this, uh, slow airs. It's a great topic. I think slow airs are, for me, fiddle renditions of singing in the old solo, ornamented solo style. And so it's like the fiddle imitating the voice in the old style. And I think that's for me in Appalachian style. I don't know what you guys think. Well, slow airs in, in Ireland, most of them if are... Um, yeah. Okay, sorry. Yeah. yeah, slow air playing in Ireland is the same, you know, and a lot of them are, uh, the melodies are from Shano's songs. Now, I don't play them. It was just one area that I just thought, mm, this is beyond me. I could get the jigs and the reels and stuff, and when it came to that, I never really did them. There are two ways, you know, there of, of going about, there is a semi sort of a classical one, I find them sh in unbearably schmaltzy myself, but it, that would uh, go uh, the, the semi-classical ones, you know. But, but um, there's an, there are an awful lot of uh, beautiful slow airs, and they go across. That it's not particularly fiddle music at all. But again, it's like Alan was saying, most of it it, does, it comes from songs. Could you guys demonstrate? That I would, but I don't play them. <laughs> Alan's going. So uh, I said air, but I don't call it an air. It's a hymn. But most of the southern slow airs very often are hymns or old ballads or something. And this is a hymn, and uh, it's uh, called The Old Churchyard. And since my wife and I are interested in cemeteries and cemetery lore, I think a lot about this one. Uh, uh, what's his name? John C. Campbell's book, The Highlander and His Home, and his The name. Southern Highlander and His Home, maybe, uh, has a section in it where he talks he or she, because it might have been Olive Dane Campbell writing it. But uh, one of the two of them says that uh, this old uh, hymn, The Old Churchyard, which would refer to going out of the church into the <coughs> churchyard, which is the cemetery, uh, actually was used in the Appalachians and in a certain church that they described in detail to go up out of the church and to do a procession up the ridge to the cemetery on the top of the ridge outside, you know. And, and so not right out in the yard anymore, it's up on the ridge. And they sang this as a processional going up. So the old churchyard... Give me chills up and down my arm. That's, that's the acid test right there. Time for maybe one or two more questions right here. Is the bridge on a fiddle identical to or different than the bridge on a violin? In my case, it's identical. I, I have, um, you know, there, that's part of this kind of myth, I think, that, oh, you're a fiddler, so you file off the bridge flat. And there are some, I guess, more in old time and bluegrass, I, I, in my experience, I, I see that more of that kind of thing going on so they can 
rub a lot of strings simultaneously, but then you have the problem of if you only want one at a time, then it's, uh, it creates problems. So there's very good reason why 500 years of violin development has resulted in a modern bridge and curvature that's thought to be standard. And so, the, you know, why reinvent the wheel, I guess? Do you have a question? Yeah, um, I heard a short reference to double stops, but I'd like to just hear a little bit, because it seems like double stops use or lack thereof is, is also another distinction between the styles. In my style, well, we already talked about the unison, which is fourth finger and open together. You use that whenever you come to rest on an open string to double it, to emphasize it. And, uh, but also, the first and third finger uh, that's Leather Breeches, which is a, a famous, well, Lord MacDonald's reel in Scotland. Uh, but uh, uh, that, that double stop is very common in Appalachian fiddling. So, so in the key of D, it's the same thing over one string. Sounds weird. Uh, that is doing leather bridges up and up, up five notes. Uh, others, uh, those are the main ones. Uh, I occasionally do some other, like a six. But uh, thirds mainly, unisons, occasional six. Any more that you do? Um. Well, I do quite a few when I'm trying to point out the harmony that's going on, because I mean, traditionally, you'd have a fiddler without any accompaniment. It's not really sort of uh, traditional to have guitars and that sort of thing that, that came in this century. And so it's always just a solo, it's a melody-based instrument, but there is kind of an implied harmony, so I'll often kind of touch on the double stops to show the harmony, so I'll do something like a... How about in Irish music? Yeah, it would, so it would be very much the similar to Alan's approach. You know, you'd use it whenever it was handy, and you'd use it occasionally, like. Something like that, you know, or if you were playing an A, mm -hmm. you would. principles would be the same as the other the other lads as well you know it again I, I wish I played a little bit more of the Ulster the, or the Donegal style because they use a lot more of it than I would and quickly a couple more questions sorry um, while you're on this topic um, I'm from Nashville I do a lot of music production here so fiddle shows up in my work a lot and I was the double stops are one of my favorite things to use because they add emphasis, particularly when somebody's coming in on a downbeat. Um, and I was curious if you thought the origin, I've always wondered about this, is it, uh, obviously it gives it more impact because you're, you're, you're hitting two strings at the same time, so you get the double impact of the rosin hitting the strings, and then sometimes you're getting two, two different notes or or you're reinforcing an octave uh, with the root. So my question is, do you think that evolved because people were trying to emulate the sound of two fiddles playing together on one fiddle, or is it, does its origin come from the pipes, which uh, did a lot to drive the, uh, the approach to playing fiddle? When you're, when you're a piper, of course, you can, you can, you've got your root note playing and then you're working against that. So, and I noticed that, that your playing in particular seems to be influenced by the, by the pipers a lot. So I was curious if 
curious if you, if any of you guys had a, a thought about what the origin was. Is, is it trying to emulate multiple fiddles, or is it a byproduct of coming from the, the pipes originally? Well, I, think, I think that uh, Alan hit on it earlier on. I think a lot of it had to be, like, if you were the only fiddle player, you want to make as much noise as you can, really. Mm -hmm. and, some, and you can do that. You can make right. it sound. And also, any instrument, you use what's there. And if you can use the double stuff and it sounds good, if you like it, well, you just keep using it. But I don't think it necessarily comes from the drones or the pipes so much as it just comes from... You can do it. You, can do it. you know, say, if you've got a, a... If you play the flute, for instance, you can't do that. So we're one up on those guys, and so there's... <laughs> okay, we, we have time for one more very patient person over here who's had his hand up for 10 minutes, so then we'll I wrap up. Uh, we're from the Terry Band in Burns part of Atlanta, and we're working on an arrangement of the old student soldier's story, which you can trace from Scott and Ireland to the cool. Earth. And I noticed that at some point, they've added a bass into it, and I was wondering where bass comes into the music and who first added it then. Uh, something more the Southern Appalachian types have the bass, and the older Scottish versions of it don't. So I was wondering who added the bass. And when you say bass, do you mean like bass line in a generic way, or do you know, like mean a big double bass? An actual yeah. double bass. Yeah. I think that's pretty well a 20th century phenomenon. Uh, bass, even when you see the word bass in the 19th century, often it meant a cello, what we would call cello. But they'll say bass, you know, well, the bass, because it's playing the bass line. And so they're describing it musically in its function. They're not describing an instrument. Well, I'm curious if you want to pause this question, because uh, in the older versions, again, it's usually um, uh, fiddle, banjo, guitar. And no, no cello, no bass, nothing until, I get it, until the, right. I guess, the American Southern versions of, of the, uh, maybe the Confederate versions of the song. Or the, yeah, in, in the South, occasionally, well, guitar came late, too, of course, so it was fiddle, either fiddle alone, maybe two fiddles alone, uh, slightly clashing, pleasantly clashing, uh, or, uh, but then fiddle and banjo as, as a duet. Uh, guitar comes in in the later 19th century, Base in the 20th century, even later, I think. Yeah. I, I, uh, I, I'm sorry, go ahead. I'm sorry. I, I would just hazard a guess that it probably didn't start coming into country music until the 30s, at least, because the early the 20s string bands like the Skillet Lickers and, 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 and those sorts of folks didn't use a bass. I'm, I'm not sure if anybody's really considered the question is when it really came into country music, but um, certainly not before the 30s, I would say. There was a great fight. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm no, sorry. you go ahead. I, Laps into storytelling here. There was a great fight at the Ozark Folk Center uh, about whether a string bass should be allowed on the stage of the traditional Ozark Folk Center. Well, it turned out to be a fight between the two factions for control of the Folk Center, which actually corresponded with the two factions politically in the town, which <laughs> went back to the Civil War All when right. there was. A, 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 well, um, I'm in hog heaven here, and I could sit here all afternoon talking to these guys and listening to them and taking questions from you, but we have other things on our agenda, and I think Jim would... He's well, I'm wondering if you had any wrap-up idea, Paul. No. No. <laughs> maybe these guys do. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if I dare suggest you all play Soldier's Joy or something. Well, like, that's what I'm wondering. Or sure. may, maybe, in a, maybe sequentially, if not together. I don't know. Yeah. Whatever feels good. Hey, there's a double stop in one traditional start. Yeah. <laughs>
Alan Jabor, Jamie Laval, Henry Benna. The preceding program is copyrighted by Emory University.